So, first a few you know basics about exam and syllabus, so that is what we will go through. So, that is coming one after that. So, this is the course content, okay. The course content has two main um, you know uh, headings, principles and then early embryonic development. So, the main focus within the next uh, you know 40 lectures or so is to really master the principles of developmental biology. So, these are basic concepts that applies to development in different contexts, meaning in diverse organisms. So, these are fundamental principles. So, that is our main goal. goal. And then as a detour, we will also get into um, an introductory series of lectures on genetics, because often times I find some students are really weak in genetics and genetics is a central uh, you know theme in developmental biology. You know whole lot of developmental biology we have learnt from genetics, okay. So, the second part I am sure we will find enough time to go to the second part early embryonic development. So, we are going to focus on the very early part of embryonic development which has lot of uh, you know conserved features among organisms. So, what we will really not cover are the developments of individual organs of a multicellular organism, okay. So, that we will probably do one or two examples, but we are not going to talk about for example, in mammals how heart develops, how brain develops, you know how liver develops like that we are not going to get into those details that is not possible in an introductory course, okay. So, this is the course content. So, now, uh, so this is the book 9th edition or 10th um, whatever 9th and after 9th any of the editions of this developmental biology by Scott Gilbert uh, will be uh, the textbook and reading that one book will be good enough, okay. So, not all of the book whatever we are covering those chapters. So, that will have ev pretty much everything that I am going to talk about, all right. So, let us now begin um, before we actually get into developmental biology. So, what we are going to do is we are going to um, look historically you know how where how did we come to where we are right now. So, if you go back couple of centuries people actually did not even know living things are made up of the same elements that are there in the periodic table. So, therefore, you know Erwin Scordinger wrote a famous book what is life and that quest that is there eternally in human mind got largely answered during this period you know 1940s to 60s the classical era of molecular biology. Do by the time the biochemists have already shown that living cells are made up of the same elements from the periodic table and we obey the laws of thermodynamics everything you know the soul mind those ideas died and we learnt that living things can be investigated the way we have investigated non-living part of the world. And this classical era of molecular biology answered some of the central questions that that are like what is the genetic material we know it is the DNA and we know how that gets copied you know for replication purpose and then that information is copied into mRNA and then translated into protein and proteins do the function. So, this is largely answering biology at the cellular level quite satisfactorily and that is why it is called the golden era or classical era. So, once this is done then to address that question what is life, what is left um, after this and that is where one of the main players during the classical era Sidney Brenner uh, in a letter to you know the MRC chairman medical research council chairman he proposed what to do now like ok we have solved this DNA to protein, genetic code, translation, tRNA, ribosome all those are all figured out. So, then he came up with this read this you know patiently you know all the classical problems in molecular biology have either been solved or will be solved in the next decade this is in the 1960s ok 63 I believe. Um, then you have this sentence the army of large numbers of American and other biochemists will fill up the details ok not major concepts he thought those are all details. Uh, they will handle all of that the chemical basis of the whatever I showed you in the previous slide. 
So, what is the big question for him in the continuation of answering what is life? I have long felt that the future of molecular biology lies in extension of research to other fields of biology notably development and the nervous system. The point is what I showed you in the previous slide is at a cellular level. Now, how different cells interact among themselves in a multicellular context, okay. So, that is what is development. So, he thought that is the natural extension of following the central question of biology. So, in that sense the questions of developmental biology are continuation of our efforts to answer what is life. So, in that sense I view developmental biology is the center of learning biology, okay. it is a continuation of learning biology. And not surprisingly most of the advances in cell biology techniques like imaging and molecular biology techniques are often developed to address the questions of developmental biology. Okay. So, that is what uh, gave rise to all those advancements in technology. So, so this, this kind of set the stage to be attracted to developmental biology. So, now let us think what is actually developmental biology? Extremely simple, you do not even need a word to define, images will be enough. So, this is a human oocyte. Okay. A symmetrical cell, the cytoplasmic contents are uniform, there is not any gradient of molecules from one place to another place. You cannot even tell which is top bottom, which is um, you know dorsal or ventral, it is totally symmetrical sphere and from there you get to this. Okay. Is not it very wonderful? Th this is the most wonderful thing on earth, this complex transformation that happens and that answering these questions is what is developmental biology. Okay. So, now let us move on. So, what are the central questions that one wants to understand in this process? They are here. So, that is the primary focus of today. We are really not going to get into uh, you know very specific topics in developmental biology because today's introduction I do not want to speed up very quickly. Um, first, there are two broader questions then within that we have you know sub questions. So, the broader question is the first thing is the egg that we saw, how does that become the adult body? Okay. So, that is one broader big question of developmental biology. Second, how does that adult body make another adult body? Okay. So, these are the two big questions of developmental biology and now let us break it down to addressable levels. The first one is cellular differentiation. So, you might think uh, I understand mitosis, I have learnt how that works in cell biology class. So, the embryo undergoes divisions and makes lot of cells, but will a lump of cells make you, you? No, right. So, you are not a lump of cells, you have lump of different kinds of cells, right. And how uh, cells that are identical become different kinds of cells. So, that is the process of cellular differentiation. So, what are the kinds if you are wondering it is uh, given in this picture. Um, yeah, so you can see at the left end you have epidermal cells, your skin cells, <coughs> nervous system, you know neurons these two do not look alike and so on if you go you know the pigment cells are very different then notochord that will come in the embryo that is a transient structure, bone you know bone cells are very different from the nephrons of the kidney right. Red blood cells no resemblance to any of the other ones we saw, muscle cells and digestive tube cells you know the intestinal mucosa if you look at the gland cells you know thyroid cell for example and the lung alveolis. So, and then the gametes the most important of all you know sperm and egg. So, these are different kinds of cells, how cells differentiate, okay, that is one of the most fundamental questions in developmental biology. And second morphogenesis, so okay, fine I know how to make neurons, okay, I made lot of neurons, will they become brain, will they become spinal cord? No, so they have to organize and take specific 
shapes like for example, here myoblasts you know muscle cells. So, a lump of muscle cells will not become muscle fiber that is not going to help you to have contraction you know and relaxation. So, they have to arrange and take a shape of the muscle fiber and that shape formation is what is morphogenesis. How does that happen? So, that is another important question in developmental biology. So, by the way you know going through these questions helps you to get an idea of what is the scope of this course, you know what am I going to learn at the end of it. So, I am talking as if these are the outstanding research questions, but at the same time this gives you an idea of what you are going to learn in this course. And the third is growth, okay. So, growth do not think that okay I eat every day and I am growing, you know I pour water and fertilizer the plant grows, what is big deal about growth, but you think uh, about growth. Uh, you will realize it has to be highly coordinated okay. Um, like you know we just did this exercise in the lab, if you stretch your hand like this okay you will find up to the tip of the longest finger exactly both hands are the same size okay they are identical. You can try like none of you will find one hand is little bigger than the other hand and your face imagine that to make your face from your you know infantile stage lot of cell divisions must have happened right. So, one more extra division big deal 100 times it divided 101 will it be very different, but yes that will be double the size of your current face. Just imagine one more division you would be a Frankenstein monster you would not be what you are and just imagine these were not coordinated in different parts of the body. Okay, suppose your nose cells divided double the time and your ears one ear was one division less, what will happen? Your body will not be proportional and there will not be functionality. So, growth is highly coordinated. So, how does this coordination happen? Okay. So, that is uh, an important question. So, the next is uh, I find the most interesting because without which evolution is not possible we would not be existing here. So, that is reproduction right, only a homo sapiens can give rise to a homo sapiens nothing else ok, none of the other organisms the wide diversity that exists none can produce, same is the case for any other species. So, how the reproduction happens? So, how are the reproductive cells specified, how do they remain different from the rest of the body ok. So, they, these cells are the germ cells, they are the ones involved in reproduction, they are the only ones that can go from diploid state to haploid state and by fusion in fertilization can restore the diploid again. How are they specified and how come they remain different from the rest? And what are the instructions in their nucleus and cytoplasm remember the oocyte cytoplasm brings lot of things for the embryonic development. So, what are they in these two struct cellular structures that help them to form the next generation. So, these are the questions of reproduction ok. And the fifth is um, evolution ok, so nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. So, good you are listening in biochemistry class <laughs> ok. So, this is do not forget this sentence ok, you just cannot understand biology without really understanding the evolutionary cause and the functional consequence of any of the process you are looking at. And now in this context in developmental biology con contest uh, there is an important thing, the important thing is the changes that are necessitated by the adaptational requirement to the environment must be possible within the existing body structure ok. When you are trying a new change for fitting into a new environment the existing organisms should not be dying ok. So, the modifications that are required will have to be permitted by the existing developmental plan the body plan. So, therefore, the development constraints uh, the possible routes of adaptation and in that sense you need to you know consider what is possible in the current developmental plan to see what adaptations are possible 
so in that sense evolution and development are you know uh, very intricately linked. So, changes in development is what gives rise to adaptation and that is what gets selected during natural selection. So, in that sense evolution is a central question in developmental biology. Okay. So, how do changes in development create new body forms and what changes can be accommodated without compromising the survival of the organism. Okay. So, that is important. So, a dinosaur becoming a bird cannot happen in one step <coughs> without endangering its current ability to exist as a dinosaur. Okay. So, so that, that is just to you know give you an example. Then we cannot forget the environment because an organism adapts to a given environment and as we just saw that has to be accommodated in the current development. So, like to give you an example which is there in the book, uh, you know you may have already heard many reptiles, their sex determination whether it is going to be male or female is dependent on the temperature and sometimes uh, chemicals in the environment also influence an organism's ability to develop. So, there, therefore, in the larger habitat, habitat means in the place and community and the ecosystem in which an organism survives, how does the developmental plan fits into it. Okay. Like for example, a, a succulent plant uh, is better fit to live in a desert environment. Okay. So, you cannot go and cr grow paddy there. So, the developmental plan of paddy or the developmental plan of a cactus is uh, fit you know integrated into the development or in, in, sorry environment into the habitat where they grow. So, in that sense we need to look at the environmental aspect as well. So, these are the you know major questions in developmental biology. So, it pretty much touches all areas of biology. Okay. So, any questions on this so far? Okay. So, we move on. So, how do we study development of an organism? So, people over the period of time they have used different approaches. Initially, when the tools were very primitive or non existing, they simply did observation of embryos. So, essentially anatomical approaches, we call them anatomical. You simply look at the anatomy of an embryo of a particular species and compare with another one, another one and so <coughs> on and then you come up with the common themes. You know for example, these things you know give birth to a baby directly okay, uh, viviparous and some lay eggs and eggs hatch okay, oviparous and so on they made classifications and they saw certain general themes and principles. So, that is the anatomical approach. This does not mean I am talking only history, currently also it is very important like for example, when you are going to define a particular developmental defect at a cell, single cell resolution, you are actually expanding that anatomical observation. So, it is there intertwined with the um, in a modern day approaches. Then once they did that, then they try to disturb the embryo and see what happens. You know, you know, if a perfectly spherical embryo divides, if it has a certain planes of cell division, if I just compress, will that change? And what kind of changes happen? And as a result, what kind of cells form? So they started experimenting. That's called experimental approaches. Then, when genetic tools became available then people started using genetic approaches you know for example, trying to find uh, mutations in which a particular development does not happen. Then I the, then when you find that that is inheritable then you have actually identified a gene that is responsible for that development. So, so that is the genetic approach. So, you might think that that is the approach that is predominating now, but the other two are also intertwined with this all three are being uh, pursued as of now, but they are sort of historical. Okay, initially it is anatomical that gave rise to experimental, then the you know later genetics, and now it's a combination of all three. So that these are the major approaches, experimental approaches to understanding development. Okay. Um, 
So, now before we go further these anatomical and experimental approaches that were there early on um, you know gave rise to I told you certain general themes and one of them is a generalizable life cycle of multiple organisms ok multiple meaning I mean uh, diversity of organisms. So, you might find organisms extremely diverse, but you actually if you look at their development from fertilized egg to either hatching or coming out of the mother's womb which is called embryology. So, that is the old name for developmental biology ok. So, embryonic development is what we call developmental biology and now we have learnt that development happens even after birth it is not merely growth to give you an idea like every time a differentiated cell dies for example, your skin epithelium falls off new skin cells develop. So, development is a continuous process in that sense, but earlier people thought that development is only from fertilized embryo egg to hatching ok that is what people thought and that was that is why it was called embryology. So, that period came up with a generalizable life cycle. So, therefore, it is um, you know really appropriate to start our uh, understanding development by starting with a life cycle ok generalized life cycle that actually breaks down development into subtopics and therefore, we can focus on each one of them. So, this is a famous quote which is there in the book and I really liked very much and that is why I got this because this actually in five lines defines um, four fields very very clearly ok. The view taken here is that the life cycle is the central unit of biology starting from fertilization to becoming a sexually mature uh, adult. So, that is the life cycle. So, that is the central thing here and evolution then becomes the alteration in life cycle through time from one style of life cycle to another style. So, that alteration is what evolution is ok it is now easy to understand you know is the process of change that transforms life cycle and genetics is the inheritance mechanism between cycles. How do I go from one adult body to another body and that is genetics how that information goes what are the principles that govern the biological information flow from one generation to another generation and the development all the changes in one life cycle ok. Classically people call phylogeny ontogeny ok ontogeny means all the changes that happen in one generation phylogeny means changes over the period of evolution meaning from mul among multiple life cycles is this clear. So, so that the so with this quote we will look at a generalized life cycle, but the pictures shown here in the cartoon are that of frog, but that applies to most organisms. So, the major stages are in capital letter ok fertilization, cleavage, gastrulation, organogenesis, then metamorphosis because there is variation in some organisms. So, you have maturity or larval stages then you have gametogenesis ok. So, these are the 1, 2, 3 I do not know what is here to get out of this ok good. So, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 stages ok. So, these are the major stages. So, the first is fertilization. So, that is that is a actually a remarkable thing that happens. Um, uh, how many of you know what is the cell division stage of the mammalian oocyte at the time of sperm entry? No, there is no mitosis here, meiosis ok then ok it is arrested before meiosis 2 that is good. In most organisms they are arrested in meiosis 1, but the stages vary ok some at the end of the prophase 1 and in some it may be different. So, essentially they are arrested in meiosis 1 and the sperm entry initiates the oocyte nucleus to complete the meiotic division and then the cellular fusion that the cytoplasmic contents fuse. Uh, you may think oh the entire cytoplasm is from the oocyte what did the sperm bring what are you talking about cytoplasm fusing uh, can you tell what is the obvious thing that this uh, sperm brings. Hmm? No, that is nucleus I am talking about cytoplasmic part 
anything at all coming from the sperm? That is correct, it is the centrioles. The oocyte will not have centrioles, the centrioles come from the sperm. Okay. So, therefore, first you have the cytoplasmic fusion. Then you, once that happens, then the nuclei fuse, the two pronuclei, and you have the deployed genetic material that the entire genetic material that that particular fertilized egg requires to transform itself into an adult body. So, all of this happens in fertilization. So, how each one of these steps triggered and regulated is the questions addressed in fertilization. And then you have a huge cell comparatively okay, like the oocyte in most organisms is bigger than the other cells of the body. And that is then divided into multiple small compartments and that is why you do not say here cell division instead you say cleavage. So, basically you are partitioning the cytoplasm into smaller cells. Okay, so, this is the fundamental difference between a normal cell division and cleavage in the embryo. And each one of those partitioned cells, so meaning you are obviously replicating DNA and therefore you are making multiple nuclei and each nuclei gets smaller portions of the cytoplasm. So, that is how it is compartmentalized. So, do not think that in this compartmentalization the nucleus is lost in one cell and not in others. And each one of these new cells formed during cleavage are called the blastomeres and at the end of this cleavage stage you call that embryo a blastula. Okay. Then the, so, how this cleavage is regulated? Th this happens in a certain pattern. You, you just cannot have anything going wrong here. It, it is like uh, you have done all the rehearsals and backstage arrangements. Now, the concert started. Now, you have to play the music or if it is dance, you have to dance in the right way. <laughs> now, you cannot choreograph once it started. It just cannot happen and it goes. There is no stopping of it. It just goes on and that has to happen in perfect order. No errors possible. Error means death, th that is the end of it. So, how all that happens? So, that is what we learn in cleavage. Okay. So, then the next one is these cells now undergo rearrangements, okay. they migrate and rearrange themselves into three major layers, we call them germ layers, okay. ectoderm, in mesoderm and endoderm. So, these germ layers are formed by migration and rearrangement of these blastomeres and then that process is called gastrulation. Okay. So, here you still do not have major differentiations that are going to happen. So, you should not get confused with the migrations and differentiation that are going to happen later. So, here primarily rearrangement of the cells into three major la layers we call germ layers and the end of that you call gastrula. Then cells of these three layers interact among themselves and undergo further rearrangements and migrations to give rise to specific functional shapes which we call organs and that is the organogenesis. Okay. So, that is how you have muscle cells making muscles and uh, you know cells from ectoderm for example, they make our skin epithelium, they make the neurons, they make the melanocytes, the pigment producing cells that protect us from the UV radiation and um, you know the inner gut lining by the endoderm and mesoderm making many of the internal organs. And some of the organs do have uh, cells from the different layers, it is not that these layers are completely you know uh, independent. So, they interact, mix as well as induce or get induced by the other cells. All those goes on in making organs okay. and then that ends in the birth or hatching. Then once they hatch, it is not right away ready, it is not when do you call ready? Only when you are sexually mature adult. So, adult by definition is a sexually matured organism of that species, it should be able to reproduce that is when the life cycle ends. So, life cycle by the way is different from generation time, generation time is the time an individual member of a species exists from birth to death. 
life cycle means from birth to the stage where you can reproduce ok. So, remember these distinctly often times um, you know some people get confused. So, when they come out from the egg shell or come out of the mother's womb they are not right away ready. So, they undergo what is called maturity and this maturity in many organisms involve what is called metamorphosis. That is because what comes out does not resemble the adult you will, as you see in this example you know the tadpole does not look like the frog, the silkworm does not look like the moth same goes with butterfly and in many organisms the adult stage is a fleeting movement of the entire life cycle ok. Some of them spend most of the time in the larval stages in most organisms such um, uh, early forms that are different from the adult form are called larval stage and these larva uh, feed and they exist for longer time in some of the organisms ok. Bulk of the time of the life cycle is spent as larva and they like for example, in moths they just come out without having ability to eat ok. So, whatever the moth ate and stored is what is it is going to use for the purpose of finding a mate and lay eggs and die ok. So, do not think um, each of these stages are constant in terms of relative duration across species ok. So, we may be living as adult for a very long time, but that is not the case in other organisms. So, how all these regulated the maturity part and some people think this is very fascinating going from the larva that comes out and how that changes into the adult form that some people think that is very very remarkable and they study metamorphosis in great detail particularly those who study butterflies and moths and of course, you know frog as well. Um, so, this is the summary of life cycle. So, basically when we are talking about development then we are talking about one of these six processes or a sub part of one of these processes. For example, in our lab we focus not what we focus on can cannot be even called fertilization, it can not even be called gametogenesis more appropriately gametogenesis, but we focus on a certain aspect of gametogenesis that is what we do. So, each one of them have you know lot of uh, interesting specialized questions, but this gives you the broader picture this helps you to map yourself you know in the broader theme of an organism development where does my work or my learning fits. So, that is why the life cycle is our starting uh, introduction here. So, we do have 5 more minutes ok, but we are actually done. So, this is this, this is what I brought today. Um, so, any questions? So, otherwise I will try to tell you some other ways of looking at development, but feel free to ask questions um, you know so far or in general about this course. So, the uh, another way of looking at development by comparing to the rest of the non living world you just compare an organism development versus a machine building does an aeroplane fly while being built no can you think of any or anything like a bicycle can be used to go from point A to B while someone is assembling it no, but organisms while being built they are functional at no point of time they were dead ok. So, the book goes into telling in, in you know very specific details you know you breathe while lungs are still forming you arrange neurons without even having learned to think ok and so on circulation happens without even building artery. So, all of these things happen. So, the here it has to function while it is being built. So, some people think that is fascinating about development ok. So, like this you can look at in many many ways uh, how um, you know developmental process is very amazing. So, what I find interesting is if you look at uh, this I am sure I have said in other courses some of you have taken my courses earlier uh, I whatever I have read I have not found anything. Uh, in the universe where the matter organizes more in a more complex way than what happens in development ok. So, you may when you think of other aspects 
in the non living world what you will find is the scales are enormous, but not the complexity or diversity of the process, but here you find that to be extremely complex. You know that first slide where you go from human egg to the baby, so that is really fascinating. You know you can break down and be interested in metamorphosis or whatever, but the end is from this cell to this infant, okay. so that is the big thing. So, Another thing is if you you know to further clarify what a developmental biology deals with is looking at the way we question different things ok. Like for example, um, you know a geneticist may be interested in how a particular genetic information goes from one uh, generation to the next generation ok. For example, if you take any gene like whatever gene you are interested in ok, let us say a gene of an RNA binding protein tri regulating translation ok. So, that is what fascinates me sir for I am picking up that example. So, a geneticist may be interested in knowing how this particular gene uh, gets transmitted from one generation to the next generation <coughs> and a biochemist may be interested in knowing how does this RNA binding protein ends up regulating translation of this particular mRNA. But what a developmental biologist asks is um, why is this particular RNA binding protein produced in these cells, but not in those cells ok. Like for example, the genes that we study in our lab why are they expressed only in germ cells and not in my brain or heart or liver, why are they only in germ cells. And the other thing is why only at a particular time during development, why does NOS1 protein is produced only from the zygotic primordial germ cells in the embryo, but not otherwise ok. So, this can be summarized in two major thing one spatial regulation of gene expression, second temporal regulation of gene expression that is the time you know why at this stage of development not at other stage. The first one is why in this organ or tissue and not in another organ or tissue. So, this spatial or spatio temporal regulation of gene expression that is the central thing that we are going to finally, come out of this course ok. So, that is what we are going to finally learn. All right, with that, I end today's uh, lecture. So, we have time if you have questions. If not, see you in the next class.